um for those of you that don't know davinder is a real life treasure hunter and author traveling quite a lot in my in my work and uh, I found this auction online I was searching through the objects I just had this strange kind of feeling that there was going to be something interesting in this in this in this sale and you know it's like hang on it's a Sikh motto Gal to high may the immortal one protect Ranjit Singh Padasha Ranjit Singh the true king and it's his personal pistol has turned up in this in this sale and I thought to myself you know I, I need to go to Germany I need to I need to go there and, and bid on this in person hello welcome to Mr Davinda Tour how are you my friend I'm very well thanks thanks so for the invitation no 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 problem at all I've been looking forward to this conversation for ages um for those of you that don't know Davinder is a real life treasure hunter and author. Um he's uh published a book called um In Pursuit of Empire Treasures from the Tool Collection. Uh Davinder, how would you describe what you actually do? Um I suppose on the on the collecting front, um I, I'm an art collector uh, with a kind of specific um particular interest in in sea art and heritage. Um yeah, so I I, uh, I search and, and look for uh, antique uh, art in the main, um, and I've been collecting for um, uh, over twenty years now. So yeah, that's that's pretty much what I do. What would what what would you kind of class as um, antiques or art, Sikh artworks? Okay, so I suppose um, strictly, I think the the, the label for uh, for antiques is is anything over a hundred years old. Um, you know that was that, that's generally how it's kind of classed, although it's not it's not that kind of prescriptive. But and then and with with regards to kind of the label of kind of seek art and antique, that's that's a that's a trickier question because I suppose actually if I'm um, if I really want to kind of class it anywhere, I suppose it's more Punjabi heritage as opposed to Punjabi art as opposed to Sikh art. So it's it's cross cultural across the kind of Hindu and Islamic faiths um, as well. Um, but in the in with regards to kind of Sikh art, you know, you can say is it is it the subjects that are Sikh or is it the artists that are Sikh? Um, and I would say more often than not, what we're looking for, what I'm looking for, are kind of Sikh patrons, um, which which then tie into kind of subject matter being Sikh specific. But uh, I suppose strictly it's it's Punjabi heritage. So you're born you're born and raised here, aren't you? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I um. So well, yeah, go on. Yeah. No, no, go on. Give, give yeah, us a little born, breakdown of what yeah. Davinda's story. And no, no, I was born in born in Watford, and uh, um, in 1980, and kind of uh, family kind of moved to Slough soon after that. So raised in Slough. Right. Uh, and, um, yeah. So uh, not far from you, I think. I was just about to say, on a side note, I mean, we'll probably have to cut this bit out. But on a side note, yeah, I'm from Reading. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Slough's um, down the road. My sister's married yeah. in Slough. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Small world. Um, That's funny because my sister was married, married in Reading. <laughs> hey, we're, practi so, yeah. we're practically family. <laughs> Look yeah, at yeah. that. Two degrees of Punjabi separation right there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so, yeah, so you're born and raised here. How does somebody who's born and raised here has all of the experience of, you know, Western life? How does, uh, how does one, like, get into C... We'll call it C-Cart. How, do, how does one get into C-Cart? Um... Initially, I suppose it's about being exposed to it. Um, I think um, you know we we'll, we know that mainly you know, growing up as a in a Sikh environment, Sikh household, and regular visits to the Gurdwara as a kid and all that kind of stuff, you kind of you know, you're surrounded by visual imagery and stories from history and all these kind of tales and epic stories in, in many ways. And um, so the next the next step from that is actually seeing a, a physical artifact, and and that happened for me I suppose for the first time um, when I was probably about thirteen or fourteen years old, you know, and you know seeing somebody and and you know we know that Sikh heritage is very much linked with martial culture, so initially it was like seeing swords and arrows or shields or something at a display at a gurdwara, mm. and. Uh, I just had a I had an interest in art and drawing and 
history growing up, just general stuff, you know, learning about Elizabethans or Tudors or Vikings or whatever it was. And, um, and then you see some material heritage in the flesh. And, you know, that's kind of uh, has a transporting kind of quality. And, uh, and I was kind of hooked then. Um, and then uh, following that periodic kind of visits to certain museums in London, being lucky and in that kind of live on the doorstep of sort of a, a lot of heritage. Um, so that was the next revelation. You find out that this stuff exists and, you know, pieces from your heritage and from your culture, from where your mum and dad came from, are actually in museums here. And um, and the next step after that was finding out that you could actually, if you looked hard enough, you could still find some of these pieces on the antique market. Um, and then and then I just kind of uh, kind of immersed myself in that world. Really, um, it helped that I had a bit of an addictive personality. <laughs> I think. Um, um, it's a so good addiction think, to have. I think it's one of the better ones, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I could could have had others. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> um, and it was just, um, you know, it's it was it was a world which was really rewarding. You know, you find something. You know, you're looking for something. You're hunting something. You're chasing something. You find something that you know, endorphin hit or whatever it is that you get. When you actually get something it must be you know similar to to gambling i suppose in a way i suppose is that kind of thrill that you get and then it just keeps you searching uh, for the next thing you know the unknown what was your what was your first ever piece like what uh, and how long ago was it okay yeah i mean the the first piece i actually still have and it was um i think i purchased it in 1998 and uh, it's it's not necessarily a Sikh piece. Uh, I, I started off not knowing that you could actually find Sikh-specific things. So I was just collecting Indian things, anything that was from India and old. And um, and my brother and I were, uh, he's, he's a bit older than me, we went to, um, my sister wanted to go to um, uh, Mega Mela in, the, in yeah, Birmingham yeah. NEC, you know, she had, she had an interest in Bollywood and stuff. And, I didn't particularly have an interest, neither did my brother. And we kind of got there and, uh, and you know, we were just outside and she said, look, I'm going to go in there. And right opposite was this, you know, antique art fair. And we were like, okay, tell you what, you go that way and we're going to go that way and we'll meet you back here in a couple of hours. And, um, and we headed off and just, you know, all sorts, a bit like kind of antique programs that you see on TV. There wasn't a kind of a Sikh heritage stall or an Indian stall. You had to just search and look and if something you know, took your interest or grabbed your attention, then you would ask about it. And uh, uh, and we we found just in the bottom of this kind of glass cabinet, this little knife. And and I recognised it as being uh, an Indian knife because I'd see, I'd seen a couple of these before, one in the British Museum. And, um, and just asked the price. And I think we haggled this guy down to about 60 quid. And my brother lent me 60 quid. And we bought this little dagger and it was... It wasn't even that old really at the time. I think at the time it was probably just under a hundred years old, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but it was just, but it was, but it was old. You know, it had it had some uh, antiquity to it, and um, and I just cherished it. Like I just, you know, I cleaned it, I used to hold it, look at it. It had little mother and pearl inserts and some brass work and some enameling and. And I can't even pinpoint to you why it was so special, really. But it was, and I don't understand what, I haven't really been able to kind of um, analyse why it was I was, you know, so interested in old things. But just as a kid, you know, I, I liked visiting old places in India, I liked talking to old people, like, you know, mm. I like hearing old stories. It was, uh, yeah. yeah, I suppose it was a bit of a kind of, that bit of a romantic, I think, as a kid. And um, um, but there was something powerful in these pieces and uh, these objects. Yeah, it's it's a strange thing because I, I I would kind of say that I guess I'm kind of similar. I don't think I don't think to the extent that you are. Obviously, I don't think I'd had the patience to go to antiques fairs. But I think books, reading about it, old stories. I'm a hundred percent with you, and I've always linked it back to the fact that up until maybe about 15, 16, the only place you ever heard these were either at the, these kinds of stories were either at the Godwara or in the household and in the wider world where you spent 
so long you know uh history during a school things like that even the literature and stuff you used to read in as part of school was always so like different mm. to you know we we taught you you mentioned there that at the time it was only just under 100 years so you know you're creeping into the 1800s you add another 50 years onto that and then boom you've got the Sikh empire which i don't know about you but conceptually always to me seems like oh you know the old days but really you think about it just, just like wait no like 50 years after that there were cars about yes yeah, right yeah 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 it's, it's and i always think that those two things are those two things are linked did you ever find the history of that dagger uh, yeah, I, I found out more about it, and uh, it, in fact, um, it was a funny story actually because I um, I used to it was the only thing I had for a while, you know, and uh, I knew that it was from India. I knew that it was I worked out that it was about a hundred years old or so, uh, and for me, you know, hundred years old was like, well, this, this is this is really ancient, you know. It's, it's uh, uh, I didn't know too much about its construction or its purpose or who might have had it. And I went to this uh, this specialist, and I used to carry it around with me. You know, you know, it's, you know, Sikhs can carry daggers and stuff. And I used to carry it. It's only a small thing, about sort of seven or eight inches long. And I used to carry it around with me. And I remember I, would, I, I went to this specialist dealer's shop, and I said to him, you know, uh, I'm looking for antique Indian you know, arms and armor, or you know, and uh, and I lifted up my my kind of shirt and I showed him this piece, and I said, uh, anything like this. And uh, and he looked at me and he went he went sorry he said sorry young man he said, he said I don't really deal in junk. And I thought right. oh hang on that took me by surprise I thought what do you, what do you mean junk, you know? And he was you know, he sounded quite rude but he wasn't being rude really he was like he said let me tell you a bit more about it. And he said uh, you know this is he said it's it's old it's got some age he said but it was made for the for the tourist trade. At that time right. So he said if this was a market kind of piece a bazaar kind of piece. It was probably relatively kind of mass produced, and uh, but this and it harks back to an earlier era, so it's a kind of like a revivalist piece in a way, uh, but it's not as good as you think it is. It's pretending to be something else, you know. This is because um, I thought, okay, I'm intrigued. You say you started telling me a bit more about it, and then I then I wanted to see, and this is so crucial, is how do you like in anything, you know, how do you benchmark? or gauge what is good you need to start off somewhere and then you kind of need to go either side from that so you need to say okay i know this now now show me something better and also show me something worse right and then and then the next time i look you know i can use that as a reference point you know and um and even with regards to its manufacturing techniques to kind of think about it and then think okay well that's happening in 1900 what's happening in 1850 all that kind of stuff so he started to educate me and and then i realized and i realized that you know okay um, I need to look for something better. I need to look for something earlier. And just as you said, you know, 50 years earlier, the Sikh Empire was still about. And um, so that's how it began. And I, and, I, and I didn't buy another one of that type again because I, I'd already outgrown it. So now I was progressing. And um, uh, so, yeah, that's how the kind of journey begins. So after a course of time, you end up building up this kind of visual memory bank you know of good things and bad things um uh, both that you've seen in the open market or you might have seen in a museum that's why it's really really important to see lots of stuff you know mm. um to, to gauge what's old what's new what's fake what's real what's and when it's old is it how good is it you know you can... what's what's kind of the vetting process so to find so let's say you you know you come across a piece. Um, you I, I guess you're at the spot now where almost visually you can kind of tell if something has certain hallmarks. But what's the piece like? Firstly, how do you identify those hallmarks? And third, um, thirdly, how how do you actually verify it, it is what it is? Hmm. Yeah, I mean that, that's a lot of that knowledge is kind of accumulated uh, over time. You know, I think over the in the early days, you know, I was trading and buying and selling a lot of things just to just to kind of feed the habit, I suppose, in a way, you know, to carry on collecting. And in that process, you don't realize it at the time, but in the process of seeing and handling thousands of things, you know, and, and really looking at them in detail, you know, you uh, you gain that experience. And 
And what's really crucial is that even whether you're buying or whether you're buying or not, you know, if there's a chance to see something in the flesh, go and see it. So whether that's going into making an appointment to go into a museum archive basement where you know things are going to be authentic, where you know thing, you know, these objects have got provenance, they've got history. And then you can have a look at them knowing that they're real, you know, uh, at the same time visiting an auction house or any other reputable dealer. And, and after that time, you'll start to, over the course of time, you'll start to understand what's real and what's not by identifying little marks or signatures or drawing parallels between something else that you know to exist that has provenance and history. And, and provenance, you know, that word is it's really crucial. Uh, it's the one thing that fakes don't often have, you know, is, is where's, the, where's the history, the back history to this object? How can we trace it back? Mm. Uh, because that will lend to kind of authenticating something. So that's that's what's crucial. I mean, you um, uh, and it's really you know it's it, like I said, it goes a lot of it goes back to that thing of kind of knowing what quality is. You know, if you see something, if I showed you something, if I showed you a really high quality painting, and you sat with it and looked at it, and you know, let's say me or somebody else kind of walk, talked you through some of the details that showed you that this painting had finesse uh, or that the artist was good, then you're, it's far easier for you to recognise something that, it's all subjective, but it's far easier for you to, to see something that isn't quite as good later on. Yeah. You know? Uh, it's, it's weird that you mention that because one of the one of the things that really sticks out in my mind from one of your exp uh, exhibitions, Empire of the Seas, was a, a painting where you sort of broke down the the actual story that was being told by the painting, mm. which ten minutes before the talk I'd actually looked at and I'd walked away from because I was like, oh, this is a nice piece, and then mm. you tell this whole backstory about how you know, one individual is going to get killed and the artist is actually disrespecting so-and-so. And like, it was amazing. It was amazing to me. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, that's that's how you bring these objects alive, isn't it, really? I mean, they, I think they say, I'm not sure exactly what the statistic is, but I think it's like, you know, 10% of the people that go to museums actually read the caption that's next to a painting, for example. You know, 90% of the people that might visit might just stand in front of the picture for like less than a minute you know and so you know, how much do you do you actually get how much do we miss um and uh you know if ever you've been on a guided tour at a museum you suddenly realize hang on a second it just opened my world to all this stuff that i didn't know about and um so yeah it was it was really important with that with that picture in particular um, yeah go on give us a little breakdown of, of, of the actual picture for our listeners yeah, it's a it's a painting uh, called uh, uh, it's what we call it the thugs, the thug scene, and it's um, it's a group of thuggies or tuggies, you know, uh, robber assassins uh, um, congregated beneath this uh, banyan tree, um, all kind of positioned and uh, kind of uh, surrounding this one lone uh, Agalinhang Sikh warrior in the in the foreground who's who's laid down his weapons and uh, surprisingly, and um, uh, and you look at this scene and you, you can't, at the beginning, you can't quite work out what's happening, but then you start looking at some of the eyes of the people and you realize that they know one another, they're looking at one another, they're signaling to one another. And then when you look in detail, you see that the chap behind the, the Nahung was sitting very relaxed and uh, unaware. You see that the, the chap who's coming up behind him has got this knotted handkerchief and he's about to be strangled. He's about to strangle the gnome. And it makes you think, well, why? You know, somewhat this artist, Scherft, uh, you know, one of the great kind of Orientalists uh, who visited the court of uh, Maharaja Shir Singh in the early 1840s. And he constructed this scene. He went to great length to paint this wonderful painting in, in oils. And uh, and, you know, a lot of the information that's in that picture, you know, gets lost. You know, we, we know at the time what was going on, but but it doesn't take very much for, for that information to not be passed down. And a lot of the information that you heard that day was was gathered uh, a little bit before, but after the painting's acquisition, you know, because the research continues. And um, and Ranjit Singh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh's doctor, uh, Dr. Honigberger, was a friend of the artist Scherft's. And he relays the, the story behind that picture 
and you know uh, and why did you know why Shirt had made this hung this potential victim of this assassination in this picture and is because Scherf's life was attempted at, by the Nahangs at the Golden Temple when he was painting a really famous uh, uh, painting uh, scene of the Golden Temple, which is in the Lahore. And, uh, you know, the Nahangs thought he was smoking and smoking was prohibited and they attempted to kill him and he escaped. And then he ends up having this hatred towards the Nahangs. At that time, the thugs, the Tuggies were kind of notorious. The Victorians were hunting them down. Scherf was fascinated by them. He visits the group of them in a, in a jail and they construct little models and tell him how, well, he constructs these little models and they tell him how they perform these robberies and assassinations. And then he puts this scene together and he makes a victim, you know, one of these hungers that attempted his life. And he puts himself into the scene where he's the guy who's about to now get his revenge on the Nahang. And it's you know, a wonderful tale um that's connected to the seat court that's connected to his visit to the golden temple that has this nang in the foreground lots of other hidden iconography and symbolism in the picture that you know it's it's our challenge now to deconstruct um so yeah it's, i mean and, and that that i'm sure that goes for for most uh pictures uh, uh that we see and i think this is why in many ways paintings um there are great vehicles to get a number of different messages across. Some of those might be hidden or cryptic messages. Some of them might be messages that the artist is trying to tell you about the subject or trying to tell you about himself. And um, I think on a, on a subconscious level, I think that's what's kept me fascinated. I think what keeps a lot of collectors fascinated and, and just generally, I think what fascinates people about art is this unspoken conversation you can have with someone um, uh, either who's contemporary to you or, or even more interesting sometimes someone who lived a long time before and it's a way for us to kind of speak to people and I, I think that primarily I think that's probably what compelled me to collect really uh, yeah with with sort of I, th I think you put it there really eloquently. And I think the one thing that you mentioned there that I, I do have to confess until I heard you break that piece down, I'd never stopped and considered, like I'd, I'd always liked the art, you know, you go to the VNA, you look at certain pieces and stuff. But I remember thinking, oh man, I should probably start doing this with paintings in general. Like I, whenever I, there used to be like a painted piece or something, always just look at it and then walk on you know the arrowheads the swords you just, you kind of sit and look at but it really did like open my eyes up, uh, eyes up to the whole thing about just how much goes into one painting mm. it's not just the strokes of the brush and the outcome that's important it's the actual story behind the piece yeah. with so you went from the from, from the dagger and now you've got something that you know you, you can call a collection what are the sort of notable or sort of favorite pieces if you like do you have in that art that spring to mind um i think um yeah i mean i think there's let me think there's two the two things i think that really speak to me when i when i collect something i mean one is um if an object is directly connected with someone uh from history um where you know, we can get to learn a bit more about a specific personality. And, and, and that object was, you know, uh, in somebody's possession who was an interesting character, uh, who lived at an interesting time and did some interesting things. And um, so in terms of a historical connection, you know, I think that's one of the things that can make uh, an object really interesting for me. Um, uh, equally, um, you know, there's, there's the objects that you know that are rare. You know, there's the objects that you know that are, uh, you don't, you just don't find them. So the, to, to even be able to find something that could have been lost forever uh, um, is, is, you know, is, is quite captivating. You kind of have something which you think, oh my God, hang on a second, I can't believe that survived all this time. And um, I was, I remember visiting this one dealer once 
and um, and I was uh, I had an object that was, was of interest to him, and uh, and he was an old collector, and he said to me, uh, and I, he said to me, "I'll oh, tell me about this object." And I told him, I said, "Oh, you know, it's uh, it's um, it's really interesting. It's a really historic object. I think you, should, you might be interested in it." And he's like, "Okay." He's what else? And, uh, and I said, "It's very rare. You know, it's a really rare thing, and you're not going to find another one." And he's like, okay, okay. And he goes, he goes, he goes, oh, it's interesting. He said, uh, and, it, and it's rare. And I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, he goes, but, but, he goes, but is it beautiful? And, and I said, uh, yeah, yeah, it is. He said, yeah, he said, well, that's important to me. And, and you know, to understand the beauty in an object it, it is subjective, but, but that's also something for me that's really important because what that, tells me is that you have an artist behind that object who was skilled who had a passion who put hours of their life you know years of their life into learning a craft who then leaves a bit of themselves behind in an object who you know a true work of art um you know you'll you'll have a piece of that artist they've sacrificed something and really poured it out you know um, selflessly and that really that just jumps out of some objects not all objects it didn't jump out of that tourist knife that I bought it didn't jump out you wouldn't you know because it wasn't that type of object but every now and then you find something else which is unique and and it allows you to engage with a person and I think that's um I think that's really crucial is this human connection actually that's behind these physical objects. Yeah. What sort of objects do you have in your collection at the moment where you kind of think and you're just like, yeah, I can't believe we've got that. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I, I bought a, an inscribed uh, uh, a pistol that, um, of, that belonged to Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And uh, and it was it was it was crazy. It was uh, it came up in an auction in Germany, and um, and at that time I was in my other work. I was traveling quite a lot in my in my work, and uh, I found this auction online. I was searching through the objects. I just had this strange kind of feeling that there was going to be something interesting in this in this in this sale, and there's this side profile of this uh, flintlock pistol. And it just had something about it, and I just uh, I I think I requested some further images of it, and then it had in gold, Gurmukhi script. It had uh, a guard to high uh, Ranjit Singh Padshah. and you know it's like hang on, it's a Sikh motto, guard to high, may the immortal one protect Ranjit Singh Padsha, Ranjit Singh the true king, and it's his personal pistol that's turned up in this in this sale, and I thought to myself, you know. I need to go to Germany. I need to. I need to go there and, and bid on this in person. I need to. And I, my schedule was quite hectic at the time. I was visiting about three different countries a week. And it just so happens that I was in a neighbouring city. I was scheduled to be in a neighbouring city in Germany the day before the auction. And it was just, you know, it was too good to be true. And and I remember going there and just seeing this, handling this, and just thinking about how has this come about. Like, you know, what's going on here? You know, what, what kind of coincidence is this? And, you know, am I meant to draw something from this or is it just, you know, am I meant to draw nothing from this? You know, does it matter that this is a personal object of Ranjit Singh or, or who cares anyway? You know, like, so, but for me, you know, to find such a personal object, such a um, famous figure from Sikh history, and then, you know, it enables us to then be able to tell that story, to talk about that person, to be able to save uh, these objects and artifacts. That's, that's one. And there's a number of, you know, there's a number of other uh, paintings and, um, you know, the early, you know, the second earliest photographs of the Golden Temple, for example, from 1858. Um, uh, or, um, you know, jewellery that belonged to uh, Rani Jindagor Ranjit Singh's last wife, Julie, that was once confiscated from her after she was separated from her son. And, you know, there's only four or five pieces of jewellery that are known. And I managed to find uh, 
four out of them, I think four out of, I think it's five or six pieces. And so there's, there's various things that kind of surface from time to time. Um, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard for me to actually think. <laughs> yeah, I'll put you on the spot a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, but there's, there's a number of things, or, or, or things connected to the, to ne objects connected to the Anglo-Sikh wars, you know, battle standards that were flying, you know, uh, all the, uh, all the big uh, howitz or the big cannon that you must have seen in the exhibition. Yeah, you know, it's it was, it was firing in the in in one of the last battles uh, for Punjab, you know, in the, um, and it's a work of art in itself. Um, so yeah, it's just remarkable, really, that all these objects kind of exist and are floating around out there. How when, with with sort of your experience and stuff, how much sort of quote unquote seek art is there out there? Because to me, it always seems so rare because you very rarely hear about it again i think maybe that's because you know we're talking about objects that are probably what going about 200 years if that mm -hmm. um that on the main sort of like frame of like artifacts and stuff they're not like the most dated of pieces the most coveted etc but they always seem rare to me mm. the two they're very rare and the two main reasons for that one is uh I think they say that the average, I think it's something like the average length that an empire kind of tends to survive is about three to 400 years or something before they collapse. Uh, and that, I think that's quite a common kind of number for, across a number of different empires. And, uh, but for the Sikhs, that, um, the empire pretty much lasts about 50 years, which is really short. And, um, and you know, that's pr predominantly when you're going to have Sikh art, you know, being produced, you're going to have the patrons you can have the wealth, the sovereignty, the money, you know, you're going to have uh, the arts are flourishing in that time. So, first of all, the period in which it's produced is relatively small. And most of the Sikh art that we see is going to go back to the you know, Ranjit Singh's era. You know, I managed to find objects out of before that, which are really rare, like from the 1700s, from the Missal period, from the Guru period. You know, those are the ones that are really coveted and sought after. So you have actually been able to find objects from, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt there, but you, yeah. you were able to find objects from, from that period. Yeah, yeah. And I, I found objects from that period and, uh, you know, just uh, the beginning of um, the beginning of last year, you know, I found a, a, a really rare painting of um, uh, Jair Singh Ganeya, who was uh, one of the, the missile leaders, the confederacy leaders, who was a contemporary of Ranjit Singh's father. Yeah, and uh, uh, it was Jai Singh's son who uh, became Ranjit Singh's father-in-law, you know, and there's a scene from the 17, um, I think it's uh, from around about the 1770s, which shows Jai Singh and, uh, uh, you know, in an, an alliance or having a discussion with another group of kind of hill rajas, hill leaders. And that, that and it's, you know, this is before Ranjit Singh's birth. This is the, the, the stage in between the kind of de death of Guru Gobind Singh and the kind of rise of kind of the, the, the missiles. Um, so, you know, these objects, they, they surface from time to time. You've got to be able to detect them when they turn up. And um, so you, you kind of, uh, they, they, they come about. But so the first thing is that the, the, um, the period in which they're produced is, is rare, is, is, short-lived after that also is that what happens to the Sikh treasury or to these Sikh artifacts the majority of them quite quickly after the annexation of Punjab like in the 18, in the 18 late 1840s early 1850s either goes directly into public museum collections whether it's the uh, the then India Museum the VNA um, or the Royal Collection or it goes into kind of noble homes as war trophies, uh, or uh, they were sold off into the open market um, with relatively generic descriptions. Uh, in the 1850s, there were a series of auctions that then sold these things off. Um, and, and so then they become hard to detect because, you know, you're, they're not, they weren't catalogued properly at the beginning. And, you know, you, you might find, I don't know, a, a gem set necklace in in an auction and it might be described as an Indian gem set necklace and you might not know that actually it once belonged to a Sikh queen or you know something like that so those are the two main things that make it really hard to find authentic Sikh art um, 
as interest picks up, um, you know, and as let's say you know we do these books or do these exhibitions, and you know, lots of people become interested, then then it starts to kind of come out of the woodwork a bit because we've assigned a value to it, you know, and then somebody is more inclined to go through their attic and say, well, actually, let me research this that, this thing that my great granddad brought back from India. Yeah, and then these things will suddenly come into the marketplace. Um, so yeah, it's a um, it's an interesting time that we're in because it's. Um, but to, to answer your question about how much actually still exists out there, it's really hard to pinpoint, like or to kind of put a number on it because you don't know how much there was to begin with. Um, but you know, I would imagine that there's there's still some remarkable things to be found and. If we're at the height of kind of seat collecting now, you'd imagine that these things will start coming through now. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the hope. With with sort of collectors, and I guess I was going to say the industry. It's not it's not an industry, but sort of like with within the sort of the subset of like seek art collection. So obviously there, there, there there's you. Are there other collectors out there with sort of like a similar goal and similar purpose? Yeah, yeah, I think there are. There was a, uh, sadly he passed away uh, not so very long ago. Um, but one of the pioneers of, of collecting C-Cart was um, Dr. Narinda Kapani from um, San Francisco. And, um, you know, it was his name that I would read, you know, in, in books and in the first exhibition that I went to uh, at the V&A in 1999. Uh, you know, I was a volunteer at that exhibition and he was very much kind of uh, fundamental to kind of having that, getting, you know, sharing a lot of his artwork that he was collecting. And there's other collectors. There are a couple of other collectors in, in the US and in Canada. Um, I'm sure there are collectors in India. Um, yeah, there's not very many, um, but I would say probably globally, there's probably half a dozen uh, seat collectors who I think are collecting on a serious level. Um, by that, I mean, I mean kind of pushing the boat out a little bit in terms of research and uh, and actively looking and searching for things. Um, so yeah, there's some, some good guys out there. That's good. I think it's always so like important, obviously as somebody with interest in, in the area, but like no real sort of collecting experience or even drive to be perfectly honest i always think it's so important to have people like yourself and these other collectors that sort of take on i wouldn't say it's a burden but sort of take on the responsibility i guess of making sure that these are these, these artifacts get preserved etc um because there is something in, just inspiring i think when you see some of these pieces like i remember was it hari singh nalwa's shield that's right yeah that you guys had and then like I, re I remember just being amazed by it. Mm. And again, period wise, we're talking about 200, 200 or so years at the time. Mm. I remember just looking at it and I was like, man, like the things that it's gone through in like such a, such a figure who we used to hear about as a, a, as children. And yet there's something here that was preserved. It's not in an attic somewhere, which kind of brings me on to possibly the only controversial bit of this, this interview. The rest of it is just me like listening wide eyed. But with the VNA, so every so every every few years things get but things pick up where they there's there's a petition or there's something to basically say that all of this stolen, let's call it stolen artwork and artifacts need to be returned to India. What are your views on that as a concept? Yeah, um, yeah it's, um, it's an interesting one. I think, um, I mean, the I think the first question is, first point I think to, to, to kind of make on this is that, you know, I think it's very easy, you know, you find, you know, you, I find it slightly comical sometimes in a way how uh, Sikhs, Specifically, we're talking about Sikh art here. So, speak Sikh specifically in the past have kind of protested about stolen heritage or protested at auctions or whatever, and said, you know, this is our stolen heritage, and it's you know, please give it back, or, or not please give it back, give it back, and um, and it just it always just seemed a bit kind of short sighted and a bit naive to me because, uh, first of all, you know, what do we mean stolen? You know, who 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 stole it from whom? 
you know, and um, you know, some some of these things were trophies of war, you know, and when you have wars, you know, you have plundering, like it's just the way it happens. Sikhs did it to plenty of other people before. And this is just the way that it goes, right? For a start. There's obviously there's some controversy around the the kind of Lahore treasury and what was supposed to be kept uh, secure for the leap seeing and returned back to him. That certainly we can look at and say that there was injustices there um, and that people profited from him and fair enough. But also, like you mentioned the word industry, there is an industry out there around antique art, which encompasses Sikh art uh, and Indian art. And a lot of these objects, when they're sold at auction, they they weren't they're not being sold by somebody who directly stole it from anybody. They're being sold by collectors, dealers, people who've paid money, purchased these things, collected these things, cherished these things, you know. And many of them, sometimes people who are selling these things, are Sikhs themselves, you know. But these protesters or the Sikh people who who Sikhs who sign these petitions, we don't we don't even think about that. We just think about English man stole it from there has kept it and now he's selling it back. We also don't think about the next thing, which is, okay, what, what happens when they turn around, this person who stole your heritage and says, here you go. You know, if we said that the DNA stole our heritage and they say, here you go, where does it go? Like, who does it go to? You know, I remember going to, once I started to learn a bit more about, you know, authentic Sikh art or Indian art, I remember going to the museum at Amritsar, you know, the, the museum in the Golden Temple, and seeing half a dozen fakes in the cabinets and then wondering where's the real stuff gone because that's a fake and everybody's you know uh um bowing down to it and all the rest of it and respecting it but nobody has a clue you know and and you kind of think well where, where's it going to go who stole it from us for a start where's it going to go and and for me personally you know my view as a collector has been well if i'm really that passionate about it the first thing I need to do is just to secure it, all right? After that, so I'm going to secure it. That, that, that's where I have to prove how interesting, how interested I am about the fragility of this priceless art that has some kind of, you know, value for the community. And then the next thing for me is then to be able to share it with people who haven't seen it so I can inspire somebody like I was inspired. And so I think, you know, when it comes down to it, like with a lot of things, you know, people and our community, you know, they've kind of got to prove how interested they really are because it's really easy to sign a petition, you know? Yeah. And if you know what I mean. Yeah, I was, I was kind of hoping that you were going to come out with something else, to be perfectly honest, just so we could have like a little bit of argument here because we're agreeing, oh, okay. on, a, we're agreeing on a lot of stuff because I 100%, 100% I agree with everything you've just said because to me, it's always a case of... I've actually got a joke written about this, which is like, you know, where could it be more convenient for me, like, you know, born and raised to go down the road and see it. But then I also kind of, when I went back to India, I went back to Punjab specifically and Delhi five years ago, if that. And by then I'd had this like notion in, in my head that, you know what, I want to go see some of these, maybe not religious sites, but a lot of stuff that was related to um, people like Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And then when I went there, I was left unbelievably disappointed mm. where a lot of stuff you'd, you'd go to, let's, let's say you'd go to a site or a Havili that, you know, had some form of historical significance and they'd give you all of this, like the, the story, this back detail and, and all of that. And then they'd just slip in there that, you know, it was rebuilt or painted over or something. And that like it got to a point where I went with one of my cousins it got to a point where I was visibly angry in some of these locations where I was just like so you guys gave it a lick of paint like do you get what I'm saying like how do you do this yeah. and I think now with the diaspora being in positions where books are so readily available we have access to sort of research facilities and things like that you mm. see some of these pictures that float about on the internet where it's like an original, let's say Gordora, because it affects religion as well. You have a picture of a Gordora pre-partition, then you have a picture now. And you're kind of like, well, where did all of these extra rooms and stuff come from? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, I, I think to me, it's just a case of, okay, they give it back. 50% will be sold. Yeah, no, no. 
yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's. Uh, I think what it is is I think we need to. Um, you know, what we're talking about here is kind of the argument for repatriation. You know, and um, or restitution. And and you know, are we qualified as a community to have that artwork back? And you know, are we qualified to, to look after it and preserve it for the future? And also, are we qualified to research it and to share that research? We have to hope that, um, I certainly hope that we we will be. I, I think we're getting there for, for sure. Um, I think it's less important geographically where it is. Uh, <clears throat> I think in this day and age, as you said, you know, a lot of the um, the kind of renaissance is being kind of revived by diaspora Sikhs who um, one is that we're actually in touch with more of that authentic heritage than those people in India um, also um, we we have the ability you know we're, we're a bit more comfortable we have the ability especially our generation to now start to delve into those things um, and so I think there's a it's probably a, there's a responsibility on us um, I mean, when I say that, I mean, I don't want to, kind of, it's not a responsibility. No one should be forced to take this up, right? So if you're interested in it, you're interested in it. You can't be forced to have an interest in something. And, you know, it, and I think this is what those exhibitions are about. It's about, we've got to expose, we've got to show people what there is and expose people to it. Out of those people, you know, some will have a general interest, some will have no interest. And, uh, and every now and then someone will come out one out of a hundred that will then take it and take it further, and uh, and and they're just naturally going to present themselves those people. But we, that only happens after we showcase, you know, our heritage in a way that is accessible, that is well researched, um, and well presented. Um, so I think the world is getting smaller. I think we we have to have some kind of uh, global kind of ownership. You know, somehow we've all got to be have a, have a piece of it. Um, and I think that's where the kind of museum structures are, her uh, are headed. That's where collections like this are headed, where we can start to kind of collectively own something. You know, um, and I think that will then kind of buys you in. Yeah. You know, um, but fundamentally, uh, you know, the, the sad truth of it is, is that with any kind of heritage, if it doesn't have a value to you in your life day to day, doesn't improve the quality of your life day to day, and you're not gonna need it, then it's gonna go. That's just how it is. You know, so material heritage in India, it was, it's being destroyed, it was being changed. It was, you know, every Gurdwara now is just a marble kind of sand castle kind of, you know, yep. block of the next. Uh, it, there's a different function, there's a different purpose. People um, are not in need of what there was once before. They might be in need of something else. Um, but I, th I think that switch is coming back. I think it's coming back around because I think there's this, um, there's this kind of pull, I think particularly from our generation. And you see, you see it very subtle ways, like over the last, I would say last kind of, 10 to 15 years you know you'd find old names coming back you know these kind of shorter names old names uh people naming their kids with kind of authentic names looking back to history to find a decent name you know you'd find you know now recently we found kind of beards and turbans coming back into fashion you know it's not it's not a new thing that you know that, that Sikhs were fashionable with beards and turbans this is an old thing it disappeared for a while and now it's kind of seeing a resurgence you know, and, and arts are kind of flourishing. You've got lots of artists kind of taking up um, uh, interests in, involved in kind of cultural kind of uh, uh, heritage. So it's happening. There's something there. I think we, um, I don't think it specifically needs to go back anywhere. I think we need to kind of open up and open up dialogues with, you know, museums and other collectors. And, and also understand, I think it's really crucial to um, the survival of, uh, this heritage is that is not just our heritage. Like it's, it's not just Sikh heritage. Let, let's not let's not start to put these lines and kind of constructs in the way like it's 
it is shared like we need that's the whole that's the whole way it survives is that we start to open up conversation and realize that we all own it you know regardless yeah. of our faith culture you know we all have a responsibility to it yeah 100 percent. i t- totally agree with everything you said i think the only beef that i tend to have with museums and stuff is that there my perception is that there's a that there's a um lack of understanding of what these artifacts and stuff actually mean to the community and specifically Sikhs and, um, and stuff because when you go to the VNA yeah they've got a Sikh exhibition and you know a Mughal exhibition and things like that but they don't they never display all of their wear, wares and I think exhibitions like special one-off exhibitions tend to be too infrequent that's yeah. my biggest beef with them yeah I think um it's just a I mean it's uh the reality of the situation with regards to museums is this museums uh i think at most um will display about five percent at most of the artifacts that they have 95 percent will be in reserve will be in storage they've got a challenge right they've they've got a challenge in that um certain types of objects need to be on a particular rotation so they don't become damaged by uv light and the rest of it uh, also, there's a great cost to having these objects, and um, and they rely very much. You know, these are these are they have to be run as businesses. You know, they these museums uh, rely on footfall. They rely on people coming in and donating money or giving money or buying a ticket. Sadly for us, the Sikh community isn't big enough for them to generate the footfall that they need, because that exhibition could be showing Picassos or Rembrandt's or Andy Warhol and you'd get you know 10 20 times as many people turning up and this is a challenge that the museums face where the community has to then engage is to then is to fundraise and say well actually this is strictly really quite fundamentally it just comes down to money you know if our objects are sitting there and you know if our community could just say okay well, look we're going to you know, fundraise and make this, uh, um, generate this, this many funds and can you match it or can you do this and, you know, let's try and put on this exhibition. Um, that's what it, that's what it requires to kind of show that there's, you know, and I think we did that with, um, you know, we had the, the exhibition that you came to in 2018. I think it was something on the lines of like one in every 10 Sikhs or something in the country came to that exhibition. Wow. Uh, and it was, or maybe even more actually. Um, and sorry, I think it was, yeah, it's about, it about that sort of number. And it was, so we've got to, you know, engage people, but we've got to work with the museums. They, they can't be left to suddenly do everything. They've got a massive, massive problem and task, which is now, mm. um, since COVID, has become even worse because now they're not having any visitors. Um, you know, so we've got to explore online stuff. We've got to ex- explore virtual stuff, um, but we've also got to kind of get sponsorship. And our community is not. Our community has got yeah. money. Our community. Is- I, I was just. I was just about to go, come around to that. I always kind of think that like these things are always within grasp of of us. Like, I mean, again, I don't mean to be out of order here, but you know, there's always money to, for you know to to get a Gordora function room or do this or do that. And I always kind of think that, you know, th- these are the type of things that you need to be yeah. investing in. Yeah. And, and it takes, it takes a patron, you know, it takes a very specific personality or personalities to come forward. First of all, you've got to see the value in this stuff. If you don't see the value in it, then you're not going to support it. Um, sadly, we also got to work in a way and understand, we have got to work with people who understand money and how to tap into people who have money to incentivize them to do it. You know, it's, it's a lot of this, you know, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It has to kind of happen. You know, these, hopefully, obviously, you, know, you, you look forward to kind of getting a, a patron who says, no, okay, look, I'll fund this, I'll do that. And, um, but that's what we've got to do. We've got to engage with those kind of people. And, um, um, and it's, it's happening. I think interest is picking up. Um, you know, but, but that's who, you know, Ranjit Singh himself was a collector. He himself, you know, uh, and a lot of his uh, sardars and nobles were, were patrons of the arts who funded art schools, 
who uh, commissioned works, who commissioned architecture, you know, um, and did all that kind of stuff. And, you know, who's doing that now? You know, um, and I think in some ways in our community, what I tend to kind of see is that, you know, we see a lot of people kind of trying and having a go, but they haven't even been fully exposed to all of the art and heritage themselves. So whenever they try something, it doesn't, you know, not necessarily doing it with good intentions, but not necessarily hitting the mark, you know. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, who does that responsibility lie with? You know, um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the good parents. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're just two dudes having a chat in it. I don't think we're going to fix anything on this Zoom call. Uh, we're nearly coming to the end of the episode. And I had one question, a slightly fun question. If you could, but well, I guess it's almost a two-part. Is there a holy grail when it comes to Sikh artifacts for you? And if you could possess one um, artifact from Sikh history, what would it be? Obviously, it doesn't have to be a specific item, but the kind of item... Oh, okay. Um, it's like a game show, this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I, th I think the Holy Grail is probably probably a collective group of objects. I think that would probably be that probably have to be connected to the to the Guru period. Um, um, I think um, in terms of um, I think anything that was connected to the Guru period, something that the the Gurus may have, have written or uh, or owned or possessed or you know either uh, some arms and armor from Guru Gobind Singh's time or something something inscribed that was connected to a specific guru in a particular part of history I think would be would be fascinating I think um, you know if I and you know many of us are you know obviously captivated by the, the stories of, of Guru Nanak and his travels um, you know I've always kind of you know tried to kind of get into the his mind when he went wandered off and went on these travels with Murdana and they just sat and played music and sang and then a you know a group of people would just flock to them and then he stayed for a little while and then moved on and you know so I've often thought you know imagine you could find the kind of original you know rabab of Murdana or something you know that that was played you know as Guru Nanak you know Murdana traveled about and um and, uh, and and sang shabbats and stuff. I think that would, I think something like that would be would be would be wonderful. I think as a as an object. Um, uh, there are also there are also objects, certain objects that um, that were connected to Guru Gobind Singh. Um, not bit, you know a bit later, a bit more tangible in a way. Uh, objects that were connected to Guru Gobind Singh um, that actually were collected by Ranjit Singh that are listed. As being um, in the the Lahore Treasury, the Doshakana of Ranjit Singh. Uh, you know, Ranjit Singh also had uh, objects that belonged to uh, Prophet Muhammad, and wow. uh, and uh, these are um, and these are listed in the in the inventory list. And you know, we don't know where a lot of these objects are now, but we'd have to assume that they weren't destroyed, so they're sitting somewhere, and yeah. some of them are going to be identifiable. So when we, you know, that would be wonderful, I think, to find something that. Um, let's say, belong to Guru Gobind Singh that was then also collected by Ranjit Singh and cherished by him. Yeah. So, um, yeah, things like that, I think, would be, would be great. There's, there's always a... Um, there, 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 there's something about, like, certain images that kind of rankle in your mind, even from when you were a kid. Like, the one thing that I've always been fascinated by are the gold-tipped um, arrows. I was like, yeah. imagine just, like, coming across... Like, when I was thinking about this episode, I was thinking about, like, imagine just coming across one of those, like what that would mean um, yeah. something something along those lines i think would be be amazing but uh, i mean davinda this has been absolutely fantastic um 100 i can't wait for like another exhibition if it ever uh, ever comes across as well and obviously our listeners can catch you at uh, on all of the social media platforms at davinda.s.tour um and obviously your book as well is on, on, on Kashi House, but we'll link to all of that good stuff below. Davinda, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Thanks a lot for the invitation again. It was wonderful.